So I'm going to start with the science basis and then I'm going to talk a little about the principal findings that are relevant from a couple of very recent special reports that we've convened from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. One on warming of 1.5 degrees, whether it's attainable, what difference it makes, what benefits. Capping warming at one and a half versus letting it go to two or even higher brings us. And the other is on climate change in land. Um, and interestingly, that was one that was asked for by the Irish government specifically, amongst others. Um, and then I'm going to use that to provide some personal reflections upon what we should do in a national context in the agricultural sector. So let's start with climate change. We're going to do this quite quickly because the message really is quite simple. Going to do it in three slides. First slide doesn't involve a piece of data on it. It's pretty arrows. What are those pretty arrows showing? Well, they're showing what we have observed in terms of changes and a number of key things we would expect to change if the world were warming. So clearly surface temperature would be increasing, but also the surface is not this kind of, this kind of area with nothing, no communication up or down. And unsurprisingly, we also find that the atmosphere is warming above the surface, as are the oceans below the surface. There are other things we would expect to happen. I mean, you, you, you all have just been through winter and you remember last summer and you remember a hot summer day is kind of sultry, it's humid. Whereas winter days are cooler, drier days. While the same goes for long-term climate change, we would expect an increase in moisture in the atmosphere and indeed we see an increase in moisture in the atmosphere. Similarly, you've all drunk a nice, cold pims um, in the summer sunshine and you put ice in it and the ice melts. Well, in a warming world, ice melts. And what do we see? We, re we see reductions in Arctic sea ice, we see reductions in glaciers, we see melting of the great ice caps of the world. So the evidence is unequivocal and that's a big word in IPCC land because that means every government in the world has agreed to a fact-based statement on this with no equivocation at all on the statement. The warming of the world is real. Why is it happening? Well, we can revert, unfortunately, we don't have parallel worlds upon which we can undertake experimentation. We have one world on which we're undertaking one uncontrolled experiment, unfortunately. But we do, we do have recourse to our understanding of that world, which we can codify via computer code, and we can run on very, very large complex computers, and we can run multiple times. And we can run multiple scenarios on these, multiple what-ifs. The blue what-if in this panel is the what if the only things that mattered in the climate change game were changes in solar output, the strength of the sun over time, and changes in explosive volcanic activities, your Pinatibos um, and your El Chichons and your other explosive volcanoes, Tambora. That's the blue. Now the red is when we add in on top of that everything we know about what humans have done to the climate system. Our burning of fossil fuels, our emissions of methane and other greenhouse gases from agriculture, our land use change. And superimposed on this is a black line. The black line is what we've actually observed. And fundamentally, until about the middle of the 20th century, you couldn't tell the difference between the red and the blue, and you couldn't tell the difference between the pair of them and the black. That does not hold after 1950. After the mid-20th century, the only way we can explain what has occurred is if we invoke human influences. Our burning of fossil fuels, our mass change of the land surface, our mass agricultural <coughs> production. So it's real. It's us, but it's also our call. So in this panel, this multi-panel figure, the colour 
The depth of the colour is how warm it's going to get. Fundamentally, the redder it is, the warmer it is, and this is all relative to a recent period baseline. Okay, and as you go across this panel, you're going through time. So the first panel is when we're all retired. The second panel is when our kids are retired. And the third panel is several generations hence. And the rows of this, so as you go down, are how serious we are about, play, about getting on top of this problem, about reducing our greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere and our other influences upon the climate system. And you can see that it gets, we get less and less serious as we go down. Okay, so if we're serious today, the world we leave behind will be warmer than the recent world, but not much. More importantly, it will be broadly the same world that we leave to our grandkids and their grandkids. Whereas if we wish to continue our lifestyles, over-exploiting the Earth system, down in the bottom row, we are passing on more and more different worlds to future generations. The colour scale along here goes to 11 degrees centigrade. So on an annual average basis in 2300, we could be leaving a world that on an annual average basis is 11 degrees warmer in some places than it is today. That's a totally different world. So, that's the science primer. It is real, it is happening, it is due to us, there is no question of it. And it's not too late to do something about it. Our choices today can matter for many generations hence. So we'll go through these couple of uh, special reports. So the first one is on global warming of 1.5. And it was a special report on the impacts of global warming at 1.5 above pre-industrial levels. There was a lot of interest in this because the Paris Accord, which you may have heard of, the parties strive for 1.5. And they said, well, if we're going to strive for 1.5, we'd better know what it buys us compared to 2 degrees centigrade, which had been a long-standing target. So this report was to do that. This report in three sound bites is that every bit of warming matters. Every bit we push the climate system relative to the stable climate. And if you look in the geological context, thousands, millions of years, the last 13,000, 12,000 years, 8,000 years, the current interglacial has been remarkably stable relative to anything in the last two and a bit million years and even longer. That stability has enabled us to grow from hunter-gatherers through agricultural, through an industrial revolution to where we are today. We're pushing the system away from that. And that's not good news. So every bit of warming matters. Every year matters. Every year we don't do, do further action on this, the problem becomes more and more acute. And every choice matters. Choices from the level of individual through to national, regional, continental. Every choice matters. Ultimately, we are 7 billion individuals, and we can't blame everyone else all of the time we have to take some personal responsibility into the matter. So what, is, what do you get at one and a half compared to two degrees? Well, the first thing it buys you is less extreme weather where people live, including extreme heat and rainfall. So there is an emerging area of science called event attribution, and things like the recent horrendous rainfall event over February in Ireland, there is very strong evidence basis to say those have been made 
much more likely by human influence upon the climate system. Six, seven or more times more likely due to human influence upon the climate system. It doesn't mean we couldn't have had that event. In the absence of human influence, it means that we have made that event and the magnitude of that event more likely. By 2100, global mean sea level rise would be about 10 centimetres lower. That matters hugely to large portions of the population around the globe who live very close to sea level. Because mean sea level is one thing, but you add on storm surges and other aspects, and that becomes a big deal. And there would be 10 million fewer people exposed to the risk of the rising sea. That's a large number of people. What else does it buy you? It buys you lower impact on biodiversity and species. We have a world that looks more like the world that we know today. But then I sometimes have to pinch myself and remember when I was a kid growing up in southeast England, in the countryside, there were thousands of house sparrows. Now when I go back to home, there is no house sparrow. There wasn't a magic point in, in the intervening years when suddenly I went from thousands of house sparrows in the hedge to none. These things, the biodiversity and climate emergencies are creeping things, things you don't see because they're happening so slowly relative to everything else. But if you pinch yourself and you think back 20 or 30 years and you try and think what the biodiversity was like, what the climate was like, you will see that they have changed. There are smaller reductions in, year, uh, smaller reductions in the yields of maize, rice and wheat. They're our staple diet. They will reduce under a warming climate. If we can keep warming to one and a half degrees rather than two degrees, we will have more feed, more food to feed the world, fundamentally. And the global population exposed to increased water shortages is over 50% less. There's a lower risk of fisheries and livelihoods that, uh, and the livelihoods that depend on them. And there's up to several hundred million fewer people exposed to climate related risk and susceptible to poverty by 2050. These aren't my words, these are the words of a very carefully considered process. All of these words are lifted directly from the summary for policymakers that is approved line by line by every government in the world. These are carefully considered benefits of keeping us down to one and a half degrees versus two degrees. So let's have a little play, deconstruct the headline figure from the report, which is this. And I'm gonna take you through it and explain in particular, the agricultural aspect that we must get our heads around nationally in Ireland. So firstly, we have, on the left-hand side of this image, we have the observations bouncing around in that kind of grey coloured bit. And then we have something called the estimated anthropogenic or human warming to date, which is the orange curve. And you'll notice that they go on top of each other. So, all of the warming to date is basically down to human influence. We can't buy a, buy a break. We don't have natural climate variability helping us. So then we can play with what if scenarios. So the only scenario that keeps us to about one and a half degrees is one, broadly speaking, in which we halve emissions by 2030 and we get to zero emissions by about 2050. Okay, that's the left-hand panel here. The middle panel is what happens in what that means in terms of cumulative carbon dioxide emissions. And the right-hand panel is the effects of everything else that we're adding, the methane and the other gases, N2O, which is from fertilizer spread and other things. And that gives us this kind of grey envelope that you see there. 
which shows us going just above one and a half for a couple of decades, potentially, and then falling below. If we wanted to, if we chose to be more ambitious in how we reduced our carbon dioxide emissions, so if we brought it back to being zero at 2040 globally, what would that mean? Well, now that grey curve has turned into this blue curve. This blue curve is lower. So the sooner we get on top of our carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions, the greater our chances of keeping below one and a half. This is why every choice and every year matters. If we don't do this, it becomes more and more difficult. But here's the kicker for Irish agriculture. All of the um, scenarios that can keep us below one and a half have a very quick peak in the non-CO2 forcing, which is almost entirely methane. This curve, if you decomposed it, most of it is methane. Methane comes primarily from ruminants. Cattle and sheep. Okay, if we chose to keep methane constant, which you will have heard quite a lot in the media in the past couple of months about methane not being a problem and etc. etc. If we chose that, if we chose just to keep it constant, said so the national herd will get no bigger, no smaller. What happens to our curve then? Okay. So we're going to not reduce it after 2030. And now that we have this purple curve, and this purple curve basically says we have very little chance of keeping below one and a half degrees unless we get a handle on these short-lived greenhouse gas form forces, primarily methane. So we can't play this game very well. There are very few options that are viable, given that we're all driving cars today, given that we currently produce energy in the way we do, we can't stop driving cars overnight. We can't stop producing energy the way we do overnight. These transitions, even if they are accelerated, will take time. The only way we can buy that time to keep to one and a half is by reducing our methane emissions in the short term. That's the fundamental bottom line. Okay, so there's that purple curve going up. So that was 1.5, and the main finding from 1.5 was, yes, if you want to keep to 1.5, you need aggressive, ag very aggressive changes across the board you can't get keep to 1.5 and give agriculture a pass, fundamentally. What about climate change and land use report? Well, again, if you want three sound bites, these are they. The land is under growing human pressure independent of climate change. We now have modified huge swathes of the global land surface much more than has ever been done before. Land is part of the solution to climate change. If we undo some of that damage, if we use the land to store some of the carbon, we can undo some of the climate damage we have done to date. But land can't do it all. We can't expect land to solve our problems. We have to address our burning of fossil fuels, our addiction to fossil fuels in addition. But it is ignorant to think that land can't help. So those are the headlines. Land is a critical resource. We rely on it for food, water, health, well-being. But it's undergrowing human pressure. And climate change is adding to these pressures. And climate, it's not just land. Climate change is a false multiplier on underlying pressures in huge swathes of the world, social pressures, other pressures. 
Climate change is a force multiplier on so much of the issues that are, cha that are challenging us today. Land provides the basis for human livelihoods and well-being. We talk about global warming being about one degree. You might have heard that recently. We're about one and, one, one and a bit degrees above pre-industrial levels already. But nearly 70% of the globe is that blue stuff called the sea. Very few people live there. It doesn't really impact people directly. Land is warming much faster. Land is already at about one and a half degrees warmer. That's because think about your breakfast, think about your toast and your coffee. Your coffee takes a lot, warm, lot longer to heat up and cool down, whereas your toast heats and cools relatively quickly. It's exactly the same fundamental principle going on. Land is your toast, coffee, uh, the ocean is your coffee. So the ocean is warming up and slowing, uh, cooling down slowly, whereas the land is a lot quicker to respond. Current use of land and loss of biodiversity are unprecedented in human history and climate change will add to those challenges. Urgent action would buffer the negative impacts from over-exploitation of resources and restri restricting the warming to well below 2 degrees would greatly reduce the negative impacts of climate change on land. So this is this linkage of these two special reports. It's telling together, pulling together a story about our need to act and our need to act quickly and in a joined up way which land has to be part of the solution but land can't do it all. We have options. The good news is several of those options do not increase the competition for land. So we can enact a solution that does not compete with other solutions or other uses of the land. But land use contributes about one quarter of current global greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, land ecosystems, particularly undisturbed ecosystems, can take up huge amounts of carbon. Some of the mitigation options include things like improving the peatlands. But there are barriers, there are always barriers to implementing adaptation and mitigation options, there are always entrenched interests. So gross emissions from agriculture, forestry and other land use make up about a third of the total greenhouse global emissions. But land accounts for 61% of our human methane emissions. That's ruminants and rice, primarily ruminants. And 50% of the nitrogen applied to agricultural land as fertilizers is not taken up by the crop and results in N2O emissions. And N2O is another greenhouse gas. So you need to be very smart in your application of fertilizer if you don't want to leave a greenhouse gas footprint on the, on the atmosphere. Grazing lands are responsible for more than one third of the total anthropogenic N2O emissions and one half of agriculture <coughs> emissions. So ruminants really are the bad boys here. There is no getting away from that scientifically. There is no way of sugarcoating that message scientifically. It is ruminants that have the greatest intensity, greenhouse gas intensity of any agricultural production. About a quarter of the mitigation pledged under the Paris Agreements is likely to come from land-based mitigation, so from the agricultural sector. The largest potential is for reducing emissions through reduced deforestation or forest degradation, a shift to plant-based diets, and reduced food and agricultural waste. Now the IPCC can't tell people to go vegetarian, but it is saying that if you want to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, you do need to become more vegetable-based in your diets. Response options that mitigate global warming will also affect the climate locally and regionally. 
So if you change the land use, if you change the irrigation, you will change the surface characteristics and that will affect the climate locally. Strong land-based mitigation scenarios include emissions reduction in other sectors. And limiting to one and a half or two degrees would require conversion of large swathes of land for afforestation, reforestation, and bioenergy crops. So we need to requisition the land that is currently grazed, for example, and reforest it and use it to burn bioenergy, uh, to, to grow bioenergy crops. The good news is the land that we are already using could feed the world in a changing climate and provide biomass for renewable energy. But, and there's always a but, it would require early and far-reaching action across several fronts. So land degradation adversely affects people's livelihoods and occurs over about a quarter of the land, Earth's ice-free land areas. And it may not feel like it, but there are almost certainly is land degradation going on in Ireland. There are soils today which are, which are impoverished, compacted, less productive, that you get into this vicious cycle of applying more and more fertilizer and pesticide to keep the land as productive as it once was. So land use changes and unsustainable land management are direct human causes of degradation and agriculture is dominant in that degradation. Climate change exacerbates those underlying issues fundamentally. So land degradation is a driver of climate change. A degraded land holds less carbon, it actually releases carbon. So when you impoverish the land, your land changes from perhaps a net sink to a net source. So you exacerbate the problem. And in some cases, land degradation can be either avoided, reduced or reversed by implementing sustainable land management restoration and rehabilitation practices. Lack of action to address land degradation, on the other hand, will increase emissions and reduce carbon sinks inconsistent with the emission reductions required to limit global warming to one and a half to two degrees. So if we continue business as usual, if we continue the overproduction, overexploitation, degradation of land, fundamentally, it will become much, much harder to meet one and a half, two, or any other climate target. The more we degrade and overuse the land, the more the land turns into a net carbon source, and the harder it gets to maintain the climate where we want it to be. What do we need to do to move this forward? Well, we need a mix of policies. We need regulation. We need land use zoning, land sparing and land sharing approaches. And that's where, for example, the reimagined cap could come in. If we do cap well, the common agriculture policy well, and tier one and tier two well, we could imagine a payment structure that actually rewarded doing the right thing in the right place. Citing renewable energy needs to be consistent with local livelihoods and needs. We need to inc include costs of environmental effects fundamentally. We need to worry about land tenure. We also need to worry about voluntary changes by citizens, not the farmers themselves necessarily, but citizens. Are they going to change diet? standards, certification, collective action, is, is movement going to occur from the citizens? Persuasive, this is where again, where the cap can come in, payments for ecosystem services. If part of the cap payment is hedgerow maintenance, which maintains the healthy ecosystem, all the better. Early warning systems, 
and risk-sharing risk mechanisms. So they're talking about a broad kind of par um, parchment that you have to fill in. There are many things that have to happen to get movement in this land use. So there is limits to adaptation in land-based carbon sinks. There are limits to what we can do. This is all about that land can do part of the problem but can't do it all. We can't take everything on land and land management. We have to do other things. Coordinated action to tackle climate change can simultaneously improve the land, food security and nutrition and help to end hunger. So one of the crazy things is that uh, currently nearly a billion people are currently under undernourished while two billion adults are either overweight or obese. It's not that we don't have enough food, it's that we don't distribute that food equitably across society. But the food system is under pressure from non-climate stressors and from climate change. Climate change is already affecting food security through increasing temperatures, changing precipitation patterns and extreme events. And it's going to get worse. And distribution of pests and diseases will change, affecting production negatively in many regions. So food and emissions, 25 to 30% globally of emissions are down to a food production. We can do better supply side practices can help mitigate climate change by reducing crop and livestock emissions, absorbing carbon in soils and biomass and decreasing emissions intensity. Consumers can do their bit in terms of their diet. And we can all do a bit better on reducing the massive amount of loss and waste that occurs in the system. And politics, policies, markets, institutions and governance are needed to make that change. But as I said, better land management can play its part in tackling climate change, but it can't do it all. What are the options? Land challenges and response options vary based upon region and context, which means Ireland's response options are different to Brazil's. But equally, Donegal's might be different from Wexford's. So there is a need to recognise differentiated opportunities and options. Some options are plus win-win. Uh, most options can be applied without competing for the available land, but some options could greatly increase competition. Bioenergy and BECS, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, are scale dependent, but they have a large mitigation potential. So if we can grow, instead of burning coal at money point, we could grow a sustainable crop and burn that at money point and furthermore capture that carbon as it's uh, that carbon from that burning process and store it deep in the ground then we could remove carbon from the system monoculture bioenergy crops though can result in land competition and have adverse effects for food land degradation, biodiversity and water scarcity. Which is that the potential for mitigating climate can only be realised if agricultural emissions are included in mainstream climate policy. We cannot continue what has been the case at the national level of agriculture constantly pleading special case. Agriculture needs to be in the mainstream of our climate policy if it is to be effective. Acting early will avert or minimise risks, reduce losses and generate returns on investment. Measuring progress towards goals is important to decision making, adaptive governance and policy success. And we need 
a flexible, adaptive, iterative approach. So those are the two special reports. What the heck does this mean for us nationally, in our national context? Well, our agriculture sector, for a developed nation, we have a huge proportion of our emissions in agriculture. The norm in a developed nation is that we have five to ten, that they have five to ten percent of their emissions profile is agriculture. We have a third. So we have a huge challenge. And everybody recognizes that agriculture is the hardest nut to crack. But if we're going to get to net zero, we're going to have to crack it. And the challenge is going to be for Ireland how to do that. Why is it such a problem? Well, our predominant farming is of ruminants, cap, cattle and sheep that emit methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. It's also a short-lived greenhouse gas. It has nine to 11 year half-life. And you will have heard in the news this, it doesn't matter because it's short-lived and it doesn't matter because it, 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 it gets removed quickly. And therefore we shouldn't be beaten over the head for it. Well, there's a, pro a couple of problems with that. One is that methane's primary means of removal is oxidation in the troposphere, and that oxidation is to water vapour and carbon dioxide. So you swap one very powerful short-lived greenhouse gas for a much less powerful but very, very much longer-lived greenhouse gas. So actually, if we wanted to keep Ireland's total agriculture sector contribution stable, we would need to reduce the national herd emissions 2% year on year, because that 2% is the effect of the CO2 oxidation escape pathway of methane. So we can't keep the herd the same. We can't keep the herd emissions the same. We're actually incrementally adding to our greenhouse gas burden. But the bigger issue here is Think about natural island without human interference. There would be a vanishingly small number of ruminants on the land. So our natural methane emissions from ruminants would be as close as damn it zero. So they're elevated due to our influence saying, well, well now we've elevated them, we can't do anything. Doesn't seem to me to be a fair and just way to think about the transition when we have a finite amount of carbon that we can emit if we're to keep globally between one and a half or two degrees. It isn't an argument that to me makes any sense. What can we do? Well, we can diversify. And in here, this is a bar chart. The length of the bars is the total carbon intensity of different food types and basically the top four bars here are various types of cows and, sh cows and sheep and everything else is everything else. So fundamentally whatever we diversify away from that isn't cattle and sheep we will reduce our impact upon the environment. Why else would we diversify? Well, it would increase our national resilience if we produce more of what we consume. We can grow broccoli, and yet we import it from southeast Spain. Why? Doesn't make any sense. It would also reduce our dependency upon a single market. We are fundamentally dependent upon the price point of beef, as has been very well shown, and dairy products. If the market fall, bottom falls out of that market, there's nowhere to go because the sector is uniquely dependent upon that one source of income, that one market. It would reduce the risk profile of the sector to out, outbreaks of pests and diseases. And I know when I've said this on national media, I've been pilloried for it. But hopefully COVID-19 is a wake-up call to people that new pests and diseases, new virulent forms of disease can and will come up. They come up to humans, they come up to cattle and other animals. Why run the risk when you can diversify the sector? <laughs>
It should also address biodiversity challenges that we have. And it can also be diversified into other things. All those roofs on the, sh on the milking sheds, they could capture that sun. If we got our energy market right, you could export it onto the grid and you could have a base um, income that had nothing to do with agricultural production at all, but actually was about how you use the land to produce energy in addition. What does it need? It needs incentives. It needs cap reform and national policy to be lined up. We need to stop supporting fundamentally the development of specialization in beef and dairy. And we need to promote diversification. We fundamentally need the right choices in the right place, which means we need a national land use plan that is non-prescriptive. So we need to understand what we have where in terms of land and what is possible to grow where, or what use of the land is possible to put where. And we need to avoid silly things like putting planting forests on peat bogs. Peat bogs are really our friends in two ways. They are a multi-centennial sink of carbon and they are also great at regulating water flows. The Shannon would not have flooded like it has in this last month if we had retained our, up, our, our raised peat bogs over the Midlands. They would have soaked it up. They would be releasing it over the entire summer season. We've denuded them and they're not there any longer. So we need appropriate and profitable options to the particular context of each farm. Not every farm will be able to grow a given crop, but we need to give each farm a range of options that are actually sensible and that are not prescriptive, but are avoiding them making the wrong choices. We need community buy-in and we need it to be a just transition. If someone spent 100,000 euros on a new milking parlour, we can't just say, hard luck, you're no, longer allowed to grow, uh, you're no longer allowed to produce dairy, you've got to do something else without any recompense at all. We have to have a just transition for the sector. The sector absolutely needs to diversify in many different ways so that we are not dependent upon a single market, a single product. Patchwork Quilt Island sounds very nice to me. It's robust, it's diverse, it supports the robust and diverse rural economy. So that's all I had to say on climate and where I think we should be going. Thank you.